You may be seated. Praise God. I was just telling Deacon Ralph last night, the six o'clock is the first time I had seen the um, announcements with that little, I don't know what they call it, the little thing that you put your phone next to. You know, it has a name. Okay. First time I ever saw one of that was in a restaurant. And uh, we, we were ordering a bottle of wine. And instead of giving you the you know, paper, because of COVID, they could do one of those things. It took me about 20 minutes to figure out how to use it. You know? <laughs> so here's where my mind goes. I'm sitting there, and that thing goes up. I said, hey, they've come a long way. They've got a wine list at the church now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very dangerous mind. That's why I'm glad that Jesus is renewing it <laughs> you know, day, by, day by day. Well, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We belong to God. We belong to God. We don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to our parents. We belong to God. We're gods. God created us. We always belong to God. When we were in our mother's womb, it was he who was forming us and knitting us. In fact, the prophet uh, Jeremiah records that before he was conceived, God knew him. We belong to God. There is no other ownership upon us except God. And there will never be a time when you don't belong to God. You are God's. We confirm that in baptism when we make the sign of the cross on you when you were baptized. You're Christ's own forever. But that was true before we did that. Before a drop of water hit your head, you belong to God we are created to be his image in the world. To reflect who God is, to show who God is and what God is like and what God is about. That's what we were created. We're created to be in relationship with God and to be an image bearer. And at the beginning of that image is that we're in his image in order to be loved by God which you already are and already were. You were loved by God. When you were in your mother's womb, you were loved by God. And you were in the presence of God. You're never a time when you were not in the presence of God. You taking a shower this morning, you were in the presence of God. God was with you. Now, here's the question whether you're aware of that or not. You're aware that you belong to God. You're aware that you're loved by God. or You're aware that you're in God's presence. But to, so, but to get hold of that and then understand that today what we're doing in confirmation has nothing to do whatsoever with whether you're pleasing God. You're already pleasing to God. Well, it's not, it can't do, it can't, he already loves you. You're not going to say, oh, now he's confirmed God loves you more. No, no. Or God's with you more. Or even you have more of the Holy Spirit. If you didn't have the Holy Spirit, you'd be dead. You follow me? It's the Spirit that gives life. Now, what you do with that Spirit is another thing. You follow me? But you have, every, every creature on earth has the Spirit of God in them. And we particularly have the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Holy Spirit is the breath of God. It's the created, it's, it's what gives us life. And when your breath leaves you, you're dead. You follow? That's why one theologian said, God is as close as your next breath. That's how close God is to you. And you belong to him. And to understand that, that at least today, you'll, you'll never 
be more loved by God than you are right now. Can't do more to get more love. Can't do anything to get rid of his love. He loves you. So then what is confirmation, this confirmation thing all about? What in the world are we doing here this morning? Let me just share my own little journey. You know, Chris talked about being confirmed. I was confirmed, hard to believe, 61 years ago. And, uh, and I remember it. Um, but I was baptized when I was one month old, exactly to the date. I was born on December 28th. I was baptized on January 28th. And um, the guy who baptized me was named Father Duffy. I vaguely remember him, not from the baptism, but... <laughs> yeah. um, and they, they baptized me. At that time, it was all private baptisms. You, you went to the church on a Saturday afternoon, and the babies were lined up one after another. And uh, the only people there were my grandparents, and um, we call them godparents. Now they're sponsors. My parents were there. And... Um, Again, I don't remember it. Uh, the only reason I know it happened is that I have this somewhere old black and white photograph that uh, my mother took and, uh, you know, of me being baptized. And you really can't see me. You see the back of my sponsors. But that's evidence that I was, was baptized. And, um, and I was taught in baptism that I was given a name. That was the first thing. Now, it's this thing that if you get baptized in our tradition, there's part where I do this at 11, the parents will come up and uh, godparents, and before we begin, I'll say, Name this child. Well, you know, why? I know their name. You know, why name this child? Well, that's very important in scripture. It was what, you know, the story of, of, uh, the parents of John the Baptist, this is what you're going to name the kid. This is what the name of Jesus is going to be. This is, your name is important. Today we name our kids, God's where some of these names come from, but we name them as a celebrity or it's a relative or it has no connection. And so the kids come for baptism with a name already. But technically, they get a name in their baptism. So when I got confirmed, the first question was asked by the bishop is, what's your name? And I would say, Craig William. And who gave you this name? And I'd say, my parents in baptism, where I was made a child of God and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. And so here there he did, I got my name. In fact, it was a tradition then, I don't know if somebody raised, that you didn't call your child by name until they were baptized. So for one month, I was the baby <laughs> because I didn't have a name. I was going to get the name when I was baptized. And then I had the name, and, and people would say the name, and I got a little, you know, they give you things with your name on it. It was a big deal. Um, so there I was, and um, I got my name and then um, grew up in the church. And I knew then that I was a Christian in the same way that I was a Bates I didn't have any choice about it. There was never a point anywhere along the line that my parents asked me whether I wanted to be a Christian or I wanted to go to church. But they didn't ask me what I wanted for dinner. Well, I mean, I was, I'm serious. Dinner got appeared on the table. And if you refused it, you had at least 12 hours before the next meal came along. And so you ate, you know? And then on my weekends when my father was home, he got to choose what's for dinner. There was no choice in the matter. I didn't get to choose whether I was gonna brush my teeth. I didn't get to choose uh, whether I was gonna go to school. Uh, all these things, I didn't get a choice. And if I wanted to do something, I had to ask permission you know, from my parents. I was basically in captivity to these two <laughs> grown adults. They ran my life. And they let me know it. And um, 
I went to ch church, therefore, every Sunday. I went twice every Sunday and went to Sunday school. Didn't have a choice. You were going to Sunday school. And one of the promises that they made at my baptism was that I would learn the creeds, the Ten Commandments, and the Our Father, which I did. I just had to learn them. That was the rule. And I learned it, and I learned what the Bible was, and I read the, had to read the Bible. And guys, it was in King James English. The these and the thous, you know, and, uh, which is what I, how I thought God talked up until you know, I was like 15. So, uh, so, and then they promised at my baptism that they would bring me to a bishop to be confirmed. I was 11, and I didn't have a choice. I would go to confirmation class, which I did every Sunday for almost two years. And we would go over things that, you know, the biggest thing I learned in confirmation class mostly was how to stay awake while they were talking about things I didn't understand. <laughs> but I got through it, and then we were tested by the priest. The priest was standing in front of us, and we had a priest that, in my memory, was nine feet tall. He was a big Navy veteran, and we had to cite, do what? We had to say the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Creed, in order to pass. And uh, I was nervous, because I didn't want to fail God. It was one thing to fail, fail spelling, but to fail God, you know, that was big. So I, I was really nervous I would get this right. And I passed. And then I was brought before, before a bishop. His name was Oliver Hart. I don't remember him. And uh, it was cool. I remember confirmation being, for one, it was the first time we could receive communion in my tradition. So I was going to receive communion. And, um, and then I got a new suit. Double-breasted suits had just come in this fashion. So I got a new double-breasted suit and a prayer book as a gift. And, uh, and I received communion for the first time. Now, I know some of you have that kind of same similar story, but the point I want to hear about my story is that I had no choice in it. My faith was my parents' faith. And I, if, if, you know, if I, I don't know what if I had gone to my parents and said, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> you know? I mean, my father would have killed me for far less than that. You know, it's, it's like, he did, I, I, it's not, it was unthinkable. And I didn't really think that I ever wanted to do it, you know? But here, here it was, it's just the choices were made. But there was this day that there was, even though I didn't have a choice to be confirmed, in the service itself, which is just going to happen in a few minutes after this, the bishop asked me, do you believe? Is this yours? Do you accept Jesus Christ? Not your parents. Not your godparents or your grandmother. Or do you? You get to make the first adult choice of your life. That's what this is about. Standing before God, serious question. Because remember, you belong to God and he's here. So if you lie, he's listening. That's to know our heart. Now, let me tell you that that doesn't mean that was the first choice to me. Now, that doesn't mean that after I made that choice, you need to do this, that I was particularly good at it. <laughs> in fact, at one point in my life, I'll show you, it got worse. You know, once I started, you know, my liberation into college was also liberation into not going to church and eating what I want, and going to bed when I want, and doing all that, and I didn't do well at it. You know, it wasn't, there's things I don't even like to think about, let alone talk about. And some of you might have that same story. 
You know, confirmation was the exit from the church. So exit from you, and you began to make choices, and they were your choices until gradually you were making all your choices, and the choices you made, you know, and I, I had the conversation with my dad, Kathy, and I was sitting around, and our kids were all together, and they were talking about the things they did when they were growing up. I, my God, if I had known, like... <laughs> And they were saying with pride, they said, we did all things, and I did them too. So I did them. And they were based on, the choices were based on all that stuff for me anyways, at least never, never would stop saying, I'm a Christian. I don't know, if anybody had come up to me and said, are you a Christian? I would have said, yeah. Now, they asked the question, what do you do about it? That was another story. A lot happened since that baptism and that confirmation. And I admit there were times that I faltered. There were times when I failed. There were times when people might not have even known I was a Christian by my behavior. And yet all that time, I belonged to God. All that time. He loved me. And I'm a Christian today and announce to you I'm a sinner. That's what I learned. And I need a Savior. I need a Savior. And guess what? I have the best Savior going. I know after 61 years, I can't save myself. Have you tried that? Some of you here? No. Trying, to sa- trying to save myself and myself was the problem. The other thing is I, I, I was able to get away from the people who wanted to save me. Have you some of those in your life? That they take it on as your personal task to save you? They're not good at it either. They can't save themselves. How can they save me? And then I got through the, I can't save anybody. One of the earliest lessons I learned as a pastor is I can't fix anybody. You should be pretty glad that I learned that. It made life a lot easier on me and you. you know? no, Jesus is the one. What I know now is Jesus is the one and he has a relationship with you and with me. And he has a plan for us because we belong to him. We're his. See, that what we're doing here in confirmation is you're coming, the confirmator comes and says, I'm going to own this now. Doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, all of a sudden you're going to go home and your parents are going to let you do whatever you want. Believe me, that ain't going to happen. But gradually, over time, they will release you to walk out what you believe and who you are. For you to hear God's word for your life. For you to know what God's will is for your life. For you to walk that out, not because you're going to be loved more or not because... uh, um, you're going to change the relationship with God, but because there's a plan. And in that plan is where the peace is. In that plan is where joy is. In that plan is where hope is. It's in that plan where you will find out who you are and what your life is supposed to be. Because you belong to God. You're his. And that's true of everybody sitting here. That's the message. And we're going to, in a, we're in a moment, as they say they believe, we're going to reaffirm our baptismal vow that somebody made for us. That was saying, probably reaffirmed it in confirmation. We're going to reaffirm, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. And I'm going to follow his way because his way is where peace is where meaning is, and where purpose is. 
And then I'm going to pray for you that you get the Holy Spirit to do that. The Holy Spirit, who Jesus says, will be the one to teach us. The Holy Spirit, who's the one that says, you're going the wrong way. Turn around. The Holy Spirit, who says, go this way. The Holy Spirit, who keeps pointing us to the Jesus that we decided to follow and is there when we're a mess. See, there's no guarantee after this, and I pray for the Holy Spirit, that everything's going to go well. You know, I tell people when I, when I actually made a commitment to Christ as an adult, I developed problems that I didn't know I had. You know, it didn't get easier. In many ways, it became more difficult. But God was always there because I belonged to him. And he loves me. And most importantly, he forgives me. I'm not a Christian because I'm perfect. I'm a Christian because I'm forgiven. That's what makes me a Christian. So when I say Jesus is my Lord and Savior, it's because I need a Savior because I'm not perfect. You follow me? Mm-hmm. You know, the people who come up and say, look, I'm a Christian. I don't smoke, drink, dance, date those who do. That's not Christianity. I mean, those are nice things. I like the dancing part. Of them. But you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, you have the people go, you're a Christian and you do that. Uh, yeah. And I'm forgiven. And, and I'm also not answerable to you. No, I'm answerable to God. He knows where I live, and I belong to him. You follow me? And we live in that forgiveness, and then we do it to each other. We're called to love and forgive one another. See, parents, you don't have perfect kids. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So you got to train them, and then you got to forgive them. And kids, you have to forgive your parents, because you didn't get a perfect set. Nobody in this room got perfect parents. They got forgiven parents. In this church, the person next to you, they're a sinner. That's why they're here. They're not here because they're perfect. You know? They're here because they're sinners. I'm tired of one of the notes I was studying the other day. It's in the scripture. Well, all these stories about, you know, examine yourself before you come to the table because you're not worthy. And and the people that struggle with that, it's like, like, wow, I can't go because I got sin in my life. We ain't never going to go if that's your thinking. I go because I got sin in my life. Because every time that's lifted up, I proclaim Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. I need the Eucharist. We need God. And we're just recognizing today, these young people, God bless them, that we're going to have the Holy Spirit, that we have the Eucharist to come to. My darkest moments... Darkest moments that I could find a church that had the Mass or communion or the Eucharist. And I can remember after coming and after confessing my sins and, and receiving communion, I, I felt free. I felt good. It's a good thing. That's not true after every sermon. A lot of times I felt dozy. But after the Eucharist, I felt good. I knew that God was in me. And then most important today, we have each other in some ways. We're in this together. We're united. People who love us. And uh, you know, the, the, everyone here at Intercessors on your side. They're in favor of you. Of you making it. They're praying for you. Particularly the clergy are available to you, to help you walk out what you've decided today. And then finally, God is on your side. God will never be against you. Listen, everybody. God will never be against you. He's on your side. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. 
He'll never abandon you. He's there for all eternity. He's with you because you belong to him. And he loves you. He died for you. Well, let's proceed with the confirmation. And uh, Deacon Ralph's in charge. 